Hey, what's up everybody? This is Ray. Welcome back to our beginner OpenGL and GL kit video tutorial series. In this part of the series, you'll learn how to add texturing to your OpenGL app. Let's start by taking a look at what the app will look like when you finish this part of the series. There are five things you need to do to enable texturing support in your OpenGL app. Let's give a high level overview of those items now, and then the rest of this video tutorial will go over them one by one. So the first thing is you need to add a new texture coordinate to your vertex structure. So far you have position and you have color, well you're gonna add one more, which is the texture coordinate. The next thing you need to do is modify your shaders to add texturing support. It's actually just a few lines of code, and we'll go over that in a few minutes. After that, your shader will now be taking a new vertex attribute and a new uniform. So just like you've done several other times in this series so far, you're gonna figure out the locations of these so you can set the values through. After that, you need to generate and set the texture and send that over to the GPU. And you can do this very easily with a function inside GLKit. The last step is you need to enable blending so that transparency is, works properly and so that your items can blend on top of other items. So let's go over these one by one. The first thing you need to do is add texture coordinates to your object. This enables you to configure how your texture is oriented on your geometry. So for example, say we want the RW logo to show up as you see it here on the front face of this cube. Well, we'd simply make a mapping that says vertex three should be the lower left of the texture. Vertex zero should be the lower right of the texture. Vertex one should be the upper right of the texture and vertex two would be the upper left of the texture. And if you want it to be on its side instead, you could just change the texture coordinates around to make it go on its side. Now you might wonder what happens to a pixel that's on the side between two vertices. Well, just like everything else works between a vertex and a fragment shader, the rasterizer will interpolate that value. So you'll basically get a pixel that's the, the position in the texture between where you've mapped the vertex one and vertex two. So in the case of the left-hand side, it would be like this middle of the middle left of the texture would be what would be sampled there. So here's what our new structure will look like. It just takes two more floats for a texture coordinate. And instead of X and Y, there the convention is when you're dealing with texture coordinates, you usually call them U and V, if you ever see that around. And then you might wonder, well, what do I put for texture coordinates exactly? Do I use the width and the height of the texture? So if, if I texture say it was 128, 128, would the upper left corner or the upper right corner, would that be 128, 128? The answer is an OpenGL no. There's a better way to do that and that's called normalized coordinates. Using normalized coordinates, the, no matter how big the image is, the bottom left is 0, 0 and the upper right is 1, 1 and you just choose the appropriate value given that. And this is nice because then if you use textures of different sizes, you don't have to change your texture coordinates. Earlier in this series, we converted our project to use index drawing rather than order drawing. And one of the goals of this was to reuse some data that was the same between vertices. Well, we can't do that necessarily with texturing because the data isn't exactly the same between vertices that are in the same position anymore. What I mean by that is, there can be the upper left corner of the front face here. It shares the position with the top face of this cube as well. But we might want different texture coordinates between the front face and the top face. For example, for the front face, we might want the, that vertex to be the upper left corner of the RW logo. But for the top face, we might want it to be the lower left corner of the RW logo. And so since they aren't exactly the same, we can't reuse the data. So what we're gonna do in this part of the series is we're gonna split up our cube rather than just having eight vertices to have four for every side and there's six sides. So every side will have four vertices and two triangles. So to figure out how to map the texture coordinates, I always like to sketch this out on paper. And here's what I came up with here of what each of these faces looks like. And then I just had to decide how I wanted to map the texture to each of these faces. So if you wanna do this on your own, you can use this as a reference. Next, you need to modify your shaders to support texturing. And this is actually fairly simple. It only needs a few lines of code. The first thing you need to do is add a new attribute for your new vertex attribute, your texture coordinate. And the vertex shader won't actually do anything with it except pass it as an input variable to the fragment shader. Now remember, before it gets to the fragment shader, the rasterizer will interpolate these values. So in your fragment shader, given a particular 
position, you might have a mix of a couple different texture coordinates based on the nearby vertices. And you might wonder what happens if it doesn't actually equate to a exact pixel inside your texture. Well, this is a property you can set when you configure a texture on what it should do. So it can either truncate the fraction and just take the nearest pixel, or it can take a blend of the nearby pixels. So one's called nearest and one's called linear. Uh, so the default, by the way, in GeoKit is linear, which is the blend of those four nearby ones. So it's got a color to use, and the way you look up a color inside your fragment shader is a built-in function called Texture2D. It takes a texture unit as a parameter. You'll learn more about what texture units are in a minute. And it also takes in this texture coordinate, and it gives you back a color. So you can just set the output color to that texture color, and you can also multiply it by other things if you want, such as the fragment color. Now that you've modified your shader, you have two new input variables. The first is the vertex attribute for your texture coordinate, and the second is the uniform that stores the texture unit for the texture. So just like you've done a bunch of other times in this workshop, this means you're going to have to modify that shader class to set the vertex attribute location to a particular spot, and similarly look up the location of that uniform so that you can go ahead and set those values. You've done this a bunch of times, you should be an old hat at this. The next thing you have to do is generate and set a texture. Now, the material I'm going to show you in this slide and the next few are made really easy for you by GeoKit. However, I think it's important to understand what goes on behind the scenes, so we're still going to cover what's going on for you. So the first thing you need to do is you need to get the raw image data. And remember, an image is just really a grid of pixel colors. So it's usually a grid that's equal to the height of the image times the width of the image, and you look up a certain XY value to get a color. And that color values depend on what type of image it is, but a lot of times you have red, green, blue, alpha colors. So in the RW logo, that's exactly what we have. And certain pixels are 1, 1, 1, 1, which means they're white. And then there's certain pixels that are 0, 0, 0, 0, which means they're transparent. So we need to load this using usually core graphics routines on iOS. And then eventually we need to send that to the GPU. But before we can send it to the GPU, we need to get the image data in a format that OpenGL expects. And the problem is, on iOS, Core Graphics uses a different coordinate system than the one that OpenGL uses. In Core Graphics, 0, 0 is the upper left of an image, with the y-axis going down and the x-axis going to the right. However, on OpenGL, 0, 0 is the bottom left instead, with the y-axis going up, not down. So luckily, this is fairly easy to fix just using two core graphics functions. The first thing you need to do is translate the coordinate system down by the height of the image. And the second thing is you have to flip the axis around. If you do that, now your image will no longer appear upside down to what you'd expect. Instead, it will appear the right way up. At this point, you have the image data in a format that OpenGL can understand. But you still have the problem that it's on your CPU and you need to send it over the GPU. There's several steps to make that happen, so let's go over them one by one. The first thing you need to do is generate a texture using the glgen-textures command. This is very similar to how you generate a buffer for a vertex buffer or an element array buffer using glgen-buffer. That allocates a memory on the GPU where you can eventually store your image data. The next thing you need to do is activate a texture slot to work with. So in OpenGL, you can have multiple textures bound to different slots because some shaders want to work with more than one texture at a time. This is different than when you're working with vertex buffers. There's only one slot where you can store a vertex buffer, and there's only one slot where you can store an index buffer at a time. But with textures, it's different. There's multiple slots. So you choose the slot you want to work with for the time being, which right now is texture 1. The next thing you need to do is bind the texture with GL bind textures. So that says, I'm working with texture unit number 1, and that is going to be pointing to this new texture that I generated earlier. So that's what I'll be working with with the rest of these commands. Then you call set parameters. This is what allows you to set various parameters on the texture, such as that blending mode that I mentioned earlier. You know, the one where I said either take the nearest pixel or take a linear blend of the pixels. And there's other types of parameters you can set on textures as well. Next, you send the image data over the GPU with gltex image 2D. It takes a bunch of parameters, including the buffer of image data, and then it sends it across the GPU. This is similar to GL buffer data. And last but not least, you have to tell your shader where it can find this texture. 
So generally you all want to, before you call your shader, you'll want to bind that texture to a certain slot, and then you pass the slot number in as the uniform. Like I said, a lot of what I just showed you is made super easy through the power of GLKit yet again, this time using GLK Texture Loader. This is the last piece of GLKit we'll be covering in this workshop because again, we're learning about shaders so we don't need GLK Base Effect. Here's what the code looks like to load a texture using GLK Texture Loader. As you can see, it's incredibly simple. It's almost just a one-liner, which is great because it saves you a whole bunch of boilerplate code that you would have had to write with core graphics and some OpenGL commands otherwise. So this does everything. It takes the image, it loads it into an image buffer, it converts the coordinate system, it generates a texture, it binds a texture slot, it sets the texture parameters, it sends the data across, and so on. Pretty much everything we've discussed so far. And in the end, you get a name for the texture. And the name of the texture, this is the same thing you would have gotten back from calling GL Gen Textures. And uh, remember, it's not the name that you send across to the shader though, it's the texture unit is what you're gonna send across. This method that you see here to load a texture, this is something that would usually be inside your model class. Once you've loaded your texture, you need to send a texture unit that has the texture loaded into it before you draw anything. So in your prepare to draw method, you want to activate a texture unit. You want to bind the texture that you got back from the GOK texture loader to that texture unit. And then as the uniform, you pass the texture unit that you loaded it into. The last thing you need to do is enable blending. This is OpenGL knows what to do when it's taking one color and drawing it on top of another color and there's some transparency involved. So there's just two lines of code like you see here. And the configuration options you see here pretty much set up the blending to work the way you'd expect. So if you have a red color and you're drawing a black color on top of that that has say 50% alpha, it will be blending a gray color-ish on top of the red color. All right, we have our cube here we left it off last time. It's colored, but it's not textured. What we want to do, first of all, is drag in some resources for this project. I have two textures here. I have this dungeon texture from one of my apps, and I have this Razeware logo. We'll be using the Razeware logo here, and for this part, we're just going to color this according to the texture. We're going to multiply the vertex colors by the texture coordinate, so it's kind of a colored RW logo rather than the white one here, but we'll leave those transparent bits transparent. So the first thing we need to do is open up rwtvertex.h and add in some texture coordinates. So that's going to be an array of two floats. So now that we have new texture coordinates, we need to make sure to pass those in in our cube here. So again, as we discussed in the lecture, it's not enough anymore to just reuse this because we're going to want to have different texture coordinates for each side. So I've already figured that all out, so I'm going to paste that in here. But if you want, you can either figure this out on your own or you can copy these or copy them from the resulting project. But I'll just scroll through this real quick in case you want to pause the video and type those in yourself. Okay, the indices have also changed, so I'm going to paste in my new array of indices here. And again, this is something that you usually will not have to do manually. You're going to see soon how you can use a 3D modeling tool to generate your vertices and indices for you. Okay, we have our new vertices and indices, and they now contain the texture coordinates appropriately. So now let's go ahead and modify our vertex and fragment shader. Starting with the vertex shader, we're going to add a new attribute for the text coordinate. And we're going to have an output variable for that. Finally, we'll just set the output variable to the input variable. That's it for the vertex shader. Let's move on to the fragment shader. We'll add the input variable. We're also going to need a uniform to keep track of the texture coordinate slot to use, and it's going to be of type sampler 2D. That's what you use for sampling a texture. And then finally, we'll have the fragment color times, and to look up the uh, color inside a texture, you use texture 2D, the built in function here. And you pass in the texture slot and the texture coordinate. Okay, that is it for our shaders. Now we just have to modify RWT base effect to pass the appropriate values in for that. So moving on to RWT base effect dot H, we're going to have to add a new property here for the, sh for the texture. Moving into base effect dot M, first is we're going to need a new uniform for the text uniform. 
and we'll look up that value here. Finally, in prepare to draw, we have to make sure that we load that texture. So let's go ahead and activate a texture slot. I'm gonna use GL Texture 1. Really, there's no reason to use one versus any of the other slots, but except so you can understand, I, I would rather use one than zero so you actually see it being set to something in particular. So BL Bind Texture. I'm gonna load a 2D texture and we'll pass in the texture that's passed in to us. And we want to use GL Uniform 1i for one integer, and we'll pass in into the text uniform slot, we'll pass in one, because we're using texture unit one. Next, we'll move on to rwtmodel.m. This is where we're gonna add the method to load a texture. And before I forget, we need to add a property to keep track of this texture too. So, First, let's make an error. We'll need that later. And get the path from this file name. Then let's give our option, dictionary of options here. So we're giving the texture loader an option to fix the origin to be the bottom left, like we discussed earlier in the lecture. And then we just load the texture with that one line of code. We gotta check if it equals nil though, and log out of error. Otherwise, we're gonna set our texture property to the resulting name of the texture. Now all we have to do is we need to, before we call prepare to draw, we need to set the texture on the shader. So in the shader prepare to draw, I'm gonna flip back there to refresh your memory of what goes on. We activate texture slot one, we pass in the texture generated from the texture loader into basically that slot, and then we say, hey, you're gonna find the texture you need in slot one. So we're almost done. Let's go ahead and go back here, and we have to call that load texture. Uh, I have to take that and move it to the header file. And last but not least, we have to enable blending. To do that, I'm gonna go over to the view controller and I'm gonna enable GL blend. I'm gonna set up the blend funk appropriately. And finally, I'm not gonna, just, just to make it look better, I'm not gonna move it down by one anymore. Actually, there's one thing I forgot. I gotta flip back to RWT base effect. We did load the uniform, but we never set up the new vertex attribute. So let's go back to vertex, rdbt vertex.h, and add in a new vertex attribute in the structure here. Going back to base effect, then we'll go ahead and bind that vertex attribute to a particular location. And flipping over to rdbt model, where we enable the vertex attributes, we gotta enable one more for the texture coordinate. And this one is only gonna have two floats in it, so I'll change the four to two. And check it out. We now have a rotating cube with texturing. All right, that's it for this video tutorial, and as always, we like to leave you off with a challenge. I think you'll really enjoy this challenge. Your first job is to make a dice cube, and your second challenge is to use masking so you're Fragment Shader will actually take two textures at a time, so you can take a texture and mask it to a certain shape, such as inside a picture frame. I hope you enjoyed this video tutorial. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.